uh, that was an in very interesting conversation with Dr. with Mr. Ramnan. And I will now move on to the next panel that we have. And uh, for those of you who have been around here for since morning, uh, uh, we we have sort of been covering a lot of different types of enablers for innovation ecosystem. Uh, the previous, for those of you who are joining new, the previous um, uh, pre uh, sessions are there on YouTube uh, link, which we will post here uh, on the chat. And you can, when this session is done, you should go uh, look at all these conversations that happened earlier the, today and yesterday. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about how do we build um, innovative products for the development sectors, what are large open spaces that are available. And we've been talking about a lot of en enablers in the space uh, from uh, funders to uh, infrastructures, um, to uh, talent in the sector, to uh, open ecosystems that are available for uh, innovators and ideators to build on top of uh, uh, the different types of solutions which have been built and not reinvent the wheel. And now we are going to the next most important, next important um, uh, enabler that we feel is very important, especially in the, in the current scenarios, is collaboration. Um, uh, I joined the social sector about two years back and the first word that I heard was that everybody should collaborate. And uh, the second sentence, of course, followed by that was how difficult it is to collaborate. So we thought we will do one session which will talk about accelerating through collaborative action. And we will bring to you some very interesting case studies of collaborations that have been formed. Uh, what are the different types of models they have looked at? What are the different types of players that should come together and, um, and collaborate with each other? So I will ask the panelists to switch on their video now and we will, um, uh, probably wait for a minute so that we let uh, people walk in and um, uh, just and then I will uh, I will introduce you to Sheena Gandhi uh, who will be moderating this session and uh, and I will let Sheena uh, um, uh, Sheena go ahead and introduce everybody else on the panel. Uh, we will be doing this as a very case study led conversation uh, so that uh, the usual uh, conversations that people have on, uh, I don't know if collaborations work. Uh, hopefully we will have an answer to that at the end of the session. Um, just give me two minutes so I will get everybody set up. Uh, Okay, uh, so uh, all right, we will get started uh, on the session for everybody who's attending. Uh, thank you for uh, attending this session with us. If you have any questions for the panelists, please leave them in the Q&A box below and uh, we will try and pick as many questions as we can. Uh, we are running five minutes late on this session. Uh, uh, hopefully, we will be able to extend by another five minutes at the end of the session. Um, uh, we thought that there is 90 minutes and we'll be able to cover a lot. But uh, since la yesterday, I've realized that 90 minutes goes by very quickly when we are doing very interesting conversations. So uh, please leave uh, questions. Uh, more interesting the questions are, more interesting is the conversation with the panel. Um, so I will start with introducing Sheena. Um, I got introduced to Sheena about 10 days back when I started thinking about what, what do I want to talk about in the social innovation track. And, uh, and one of our mentors messaged me and saying, if you're thinking of collaboration, the person you have to ask is, is Sheena. Sheena is a co-founder of Sahayog Foundation. And I will let her uh, tell you the story of why she's the best person to talk about collaboration. Thank you, Priya. Um, welcome, everyone. Good evening. I'm sure it's been a very hectic day, and uh, I'm sure this is going to be a very engaging session uh, from different perspectives. Um, that we have a very interesting panel uh, with ourselves to bring um, about their works in collaboration and partnerships. Um, before I get into the session, um, I would just like to take one step and um, 
speak about Sahayog. Uh, Sahayog uh, Foundation primarily um, believes in driving collaborations and partnerships um, in India. So we work with the ecosystem and the ecosystem players. Um, and um, that's so whether you're a nonprofit or a donor um, or an intermediary, if you believe in partnerships and collaborations, we're there. So just moving along, um, why is it that we're here today? Um, and as part of the social innovation, I think collaboration is a key um, pillar of it. Um, issues that the nonprofits and the, and the country today are facing are layered and they're interconnected and multi-dimensional. Partnerships can help create synergies and collectively strengthen the sector. And that's our firm belief. And the session today, as Priya mentioned, is sharing case studies of partnerships and collaborations from very different perspectives. Um, so it's not just from a one-sided one view, it's to understand what are the multi-stakeholders involved, how is it that we make it happen, and a lot of the case studies that are currently, that they're going to be sharing with you, are, you, are going to elaborate on that factor. The end goal that all nonprofits really want to achieve is really greater benefit for their recipients of the programs. And collaboration gives you that multiplied gain. Um, at, as well as at the same time, leverage helps you leverage each other's strengths and expertise. Um, now, I would just like to take a minute and introduce to you each and every one of the um, uh, panelists that I have with me. I'll start with Rikin Gandhi. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of uh, Digital Green. Uh, he's also a TED Fellow and uh, an al alum from MIT and uh, Carnegie Mellon. He's very passionate about bringing technology uh, and partnerships to healthy agricultural community. And, his, uh, and Digital Green is a global development organization that empowers farmers to lift themselves out of poverty uh, by harnessing collective power of technology and grassroots level partnerships. Um, after Rikin, uh, will, it will be Shelja Mehta, who uh, represents um, uh, the 10 to 19 Dasra Adolescence Collaborative. Um, she leads, uh, leads that piece there. She provides strategic inputs as well as overseas operations, partnerships, and financial planning. So she's an all-in-one team. Um, the 10 to 19 Dasra Collaborative is a national initiative that unites funders, uh, nonprofits, technical experts, government to transform lives of adolescents. And she will tell you a lot more. Moving on to Dr. Ganesh Natarajan, um, who is the executive chairman and founder of 5F World, a platform of skills, startups, and social ventures in India. He's a distinguished alumnus, award winner of IIT Bombay. And he's going to be sharing with us a case study on the Pune City Connect, uh, which is basically drives various forces of social development uh, that are already operating in the city. And how is it that you can actually bring them together for collective action and common vision? And last but not, not the least is uh, Atul Gandhi, who um, is leads the investments and programs for Eagle Give um, Foundation. He comes with 15 years of experience in the development sector and has supported leading organizations in program evaluations and developing computerized MIS systems. So uh, if you have questions on monitoring, he's the guy for you. Um, he will be speaking about the Eagle Give Coalition uh, for Transforming Education. Uh, the coalition aims to identify and disseminate best practices to improve learning outcomes for children from grade one to seven. Uh, that can be integrated into the government system. Um, we also have three additional case studies that have come up in response to the COVID-19 crisis. While these are new partnerships, I think they've been able to make a lot of headway as well as are very, very active. Uh, the first one to begin with will be the COVID-19 collaborative, which is a peer learning platform initiated by Atma, Bridgespan and the ETE uh, Chandra Foundation. The second one is the COVID-19 Pandemic Wellbeing Task Force, which is for the grassroots level government. It's a digital task force uh, mm -hmm. to help frontline workers. Uh, it enables them to deliver essential care um, services in a contactless manner uh, through technology. 
Um, and the last one is the community collaborative, which is an attempt to bring together organizations to focus on outcomes uh, for a particular geography and facilitate, facilitate collective action. So I will take, um, we also have um, representatives from, um, uh, from the COVID collaborative, um, the task force, as well as the uh, community collaborative here for questions if, um, in case those need to be answered. Uh, Mary Ellen is there, um, Priyanjali Dutt from uh, Arogya Foundation, as well as Chandrika Rao uh, from Sahiyo Foundation will answer. Uh, now, may I request um, uh, Rikin to tell us about uh, Digital Green. Great. Thank you so much, Sheena. Really appreciate that introduction. Um, so at Digital Green, uh, we started 14 years ago uh, with a premise of thinking about what could be the role of technology for small scale agricultural producer communities. Now, of course, there are so many organizations in this space, uh, but the challenges of meeting the needs of a large and diverse community of farmers are vast and oftentimes intractable. And so where we began at Digital Green was by partnering with local organizations that were already working with these farming communities and training them on improved practices that could boost their productivity, connect them with markets. And the way that we went about doing so was really starting with the communities themselves. The model that we have is to train these local organizations to produce short eight to 10 minute videos that are by the farmers and for the farmers to share best practices more efficiently. And then to facilitate the screening of these videos amongst various types of women's health help groups and farmer producer organizations at the community level in sync with the cropping season. As these videos are then shared, data and feedback is collected about which videos individual farmers are exposed to, what questions they have, and what practices they ultimately adopt. And that data and that feedback then informs and targets the production and distribution of the next set of videos to essentially get these rural communities into a cycle of learning uh, that is in sync with their needs and with their interests. Over time, we've been able to scale this work over the last 14 years to more than three and a half million odd farmers, very much in partnership with these organizations at the grassroots level. We began by working with various NGOs that have a great reputation in the rural development space across India, organizations like Padan, Baif, Samaj Pragati Sayog, and it was because of the work and the impact that we were able to share with these partner organizations on the ground that the government took notice uh, when they were creating, uh, in, back in uh, 2012, the National Rural Livelihood Mission. And in partnership with the National Rural Livelihood Mission and their state rural livelihood missions in states like Jharkhand, Orissa, Bihar, Andhra Pradesh, and the like, we've been able to enter into partnerships where these government agencies have taken on the capital investment for running the approach of investing in cameras and projectors, as well as the human resources to actually operationalize the day-to-day -day work of producing and sharing these videos and collecting data and feedback and getting this whole iterative loop uh, into actual practical action. And that's what's enabled us to grow in this uh, exponential way over time. At the same time, there have been, of course, real challenges. If you can see, even on this graph, it was a slow rise in the beginning uh, as we needed to build ownership, not just from the top, but also from the bottoms up of these large scale government extension programs for each individual across these systems to really see the value of it in their day-to-day -day work. Things like uh, these village level extension workers of these government partners, seeing how uh, this approach could reduce their day-to-day -day burden was really critical for their own uptake and their own motivation to really see this as something that they could take forward. 
Same too at the upper levels of, of these uh, government systems, for them to see how the data and the feedback that was coming from these farming communities could inform not just the production of new videos, but their policies and their programs more broadly. Now, of course, as a result of COVID-19, uh, these group screenings of videos are no longer possible because of the social and physical distancing requirements that are presently at place. However, we have been able to see how the approach that we have been able to roll out with our partners is able to build resilience in even moments like these. The way that we work is by starting with the farming communities themselves. They're informal social networks of how farmers share information with one another about what crops they grow and what practices they apply with their family members and with their neighbors is the same informal social networks that we start off with. And then what we layer is these extension partners, these government departments of rural development, NGOs, and, and now also private sector that have working with these communities have been able to formalize these informal social networks in the form of women's health help groups and farmer producer organizations. And as some of you may have heard about, many of these self-help groups, including in places like Jharkhand and Bihar, have shown so much resilience that they have proactively produced protective personal equipment in the form of hand sanitizers and face masks that they're not just using to protect themselves, but that they're actually even creating new business opportunities uh, for themselves and for their broader communities. And is those networks of those frontline extension workers and those formal uh, social organizations of the communities that these partners have mobilized, that we then come in and introduce this digital network of using peer-to-peer -peer videos to share best practices more efficiently. And where we've been able to leverage the fact that we had the phone numbers of these individuals, that even though these groups are no longer able to meet in this present moment, that they can be continue to be engaged externally and within themselves via WhatsApp and other such channels. In addition, we've been able to see how given the lockdowns and how difficult it is for many of these farmers to not just learn about improved practices on agriculture, but also to be able to communicate messages related to COVID awareness and, and mitigation, as well as the secondary effects on their livelihoods, wherein many farmers, as you may have read about, are struggled to be able to sell their produce at market. And we've been able to leverage this network to list the available produce that farmers have that would otherwise perish and go to waste uh, to enable buyers to discover what produce is available in which locations uh, amongst these farming communities that we work with. And through various types of randomized control trials that other third party research organizations have been able to conduct, we've been able to see that this approach, you know, has not just been able to scale, but has actually translated into real impact uh, when it comes to at an individual farmer level, boost in productivity of about 50%, uh, and at a systems level to really change the cost uh, that it takes for these government extension programs to reach each individual farmer. Uh, from a factor uh, of, by a factor of 10. And this is what we believe will be important as we go forward uh, post COVID, wherein there's gonna be even more importance of self-reliance and uh, enabling of these local communities and local partner networks uh, to not just uh, maintain their own status quo, but build their own resilience to be able to share information with one another, connect with markets, and become better decision makers and entrepreneurs in their own right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rikun. Um, it was very insightful, especially the use of technology. And I think it's a great example of collaborating with the community, uh, by the community and for the community. So thank you so much. Uh, now, I would like to request uh, Shelja to speak about Dasra's 10 to 19 Adolescence Collaborative. Yeah, sure, Sheena. I have five minutes, right? Right now, I want to stick to time. So I'm going to start my timer. <laughs> um, okay. 
Uh, thanks so much for having us. Um, I represent the 10 to 19 Adolescents Collaborative. Uh, what I'm going to try and do, and you know, it was great to listen to Rick and, and uh, talk about the power of networks. Uh, what I'm hoping to take you through is a little more about our insights and learnings from running the collaborative. Uh, so there are three things. One, when to collaborate uh, and when not to collaborate is what I hope to cover quickly. Secondly, to talk about the transformative effect of collaborating in terms of impact, um, because there is the notion that collaboratives sometimes just go round and round in trying to figure out dates and you know when to meet and lunches, etc. But what's really the work that gets done? And thirdly, also then speak through some of the top level challenges and just share a bit of you know, our experience in how we've navigated through these challenges. And hopefully, therefore, uh, the group here listening and participating uh, can also kind of be encouraged to understand how and when to participate in collaboratives. So, uh, you know, um, I heard Priya talk about the fact that in the social sector, you always, you know, hear about collaboratives, etc. cetera. Um, however, I think if we were to think about when is it the right time to collaborate, uh, you have to look at things like the magnitude of the issue that you're trying to solve, the amount of players, the continuum of the issues that exist again. Um, and you have to look at the kind of effort that is required. So if I can just use an example uh, of adolescence, right? That's where our focus is. If you look at the, 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 the magnitude of the fact that we have the largest uh, global and historical set of young people uh, currently in the world, um, you have to look at the fact that they are also actually right now the most vulnerable. We've seen how COVID has impacted their vulnerability, right? And India as a, a nation bears uh, approximately one fifth of the global burden. So when we talk about this age range, when we talk about things around delaying age of marriage, completing secondary education, delaying age of first pregnancy, you can only imagine how complex the solutions probably will have to be. And in this case, therefore, there is no question that we have to collaborate. There is no option but the fact that all of us as different players have to come together. And who are these players? Funders, civil society, social businesses, media, experts and academicians, and of course, different types and sets of funders. And it's very important for us to bring together also the government at the beginning itself as we start uh, planning, in fact, the collaborative. So um, there are also times when I would recommend that as a group in civil society, we think about either joining collaboratives or being part of collaboratives. It's not necessary always for us to start the collaboratives ourselves. And the whole idea or the mission here is that we are able to move beyond silos and really join collective efforts that are existing. So that's a quick idea of when and when not to uh, be parts of collaboratives. The second part I want to talk about is uh, this whole uh, idea of impact. And by impact uh, in collaboratives, I'm going to just take an example uh, of uh, you know, the slide that's coming up. By no means is this a report card or a show off. I want to illustrate how in the 10 to 19 collaborative, the way we look at impact is not the one plus one, two, but how do you actually ensure all the players come together and do the one and one 11, right? And to take an example uh, here for this group, if you look at the fact, uh, if you look at the bottom right, you see 52.6 million US dollars is what we've been able to leverage uh, in the past uh, two years for the sector of 10 to 9, uh, for the sector of adolescence, this money hasn't come directly all of it to Dasra at all. We've been able to channelize and influence this money to go to a series of organizations who are doing good work. And the only way we were able to do it is because we had multiple sets of voices who were able to speak to that uh, you know, target funder or the government for this funding to say this is required and this is how it's supposed to be done. So I think that is one example. If you look at the top right hand corner again, you see 220 plus organizations, right, nationally. Now, again, this is really, really important in terms of being efficient, uh, in being uh, effective, because uh, as we know, and you know, we have to admit it to ourselves, at least in the social sector, there is a lot of uh, competition. Curriculums are kind of our currency, and we completely understand why. Because every time we are being asked to pitch our unique proposition to funders, however, is there, uh, can we look at this as a, 
not a zero sum game but look at uh, look at it as saying that if i am able to build on something that is being done or use that and uh, take it forward or understand actually not just best practices when have other organizations failed can we talk about it can we address it look at it and then move forward from it and use that almost as a leverage so this is just a quick example to say that impact is created if you have your set of goals and a systematic approach to it and very lastly sorry uh, just 30 seconds more if i go on to the next part which is just uh, uh, to say that it's important to collaborate but what are the challenges or how do you navigate the challenges are uh, three things here one uh we have found it extremely important to have a set of goals or outcomes that unites everybody under this effort so delaying age of marriage completing secondary education delaying age of first pregnancy increasing the agency and ensuring you know a full a tra successful transition into livelihoods with uh, uh, into livelihoods successfully um i think having that at the upfront and getting alignment leads to a no egos no logos kind of mentality that then brings people under the tent secondly it's very very important and you know i i i just wanted to say that it is by no means that i am a one person in all and i i'm not sure at all that i can claim that there's a huge set of teams people across who actually spend time on ensuring that you work in a collaborative so two things there one is that you need to have resources time and skill sets specifically to participate in collaboratives and secondly within the range of players in in this collaborative network um, there needs to be a, a facilitating body so in this case in 10 to 19 dasra has that uh, th that has that leverage has that experience and was able to bring those skill sets and third is something seemingly very simple but very important is to communicate regularly and communicate on the milestones that you have achieved so that as a group you can see how you are making progress to the really you know long term outcomes that we hold ourselves accountable to uh, so with this i will pause uh, sorry i took a little extra time but back to you sheena and happy to answer questions uh, on some of this in the question answer round Thank you, Shelja. I am. Um, thank you for sharing your work. I think uh, some of the work that you've done is great, and I think some of the really key points that you really highlighted was the fact that on the multiplier impact, on the fact that you need an anchor partner to be able to hold this together, and the importance of shared common outcomes and goals. Uh, I think that alignment is so critical when you are thinking through. either joining or participating or co-creating a a collaborative so thank you so much for that uh, now i would like to request dr natrajan to speak about the pune city connect thank you very much sheena and thank you priya for setting this up uh, since it's a case study session i think it's important i start with a story so this is 2015 and i was the ceo of this company called zensar and we were setting up a little digital literacy center in a slum community in pune and i met a young dynamic municipal commissioner for the first time at the end of it he made a speech and then he asked me look how are you going to scale these things you're one company there are many companies there are many skilling agencies why don't we all work together and i kind of laughed and i said kunal you know how it is private sector will never work with government and government never trusts private sector he said try me and the presentation i'll show you is actually what happened when we actually tried to make collaboration happen here we go so it's now a five year old story and i really believe and i'm a complete convert that if you want measurable impact you want scale collaboration is probably the only way and i think what we heard in the previous presentation is one example what ricking talked about is another but let me tell you how this works here this is city remember so we're talking about a whole city with 650 slum communities 2 lakh families who are below the poverty line and they coexist with many of us who live in much better circumstances but the need for collaboration we felt was primarily because we have multiple reasons to collaborate i mean if you look at as i mentioned earlier government the uh, the corporates the citizens everybody wants to do something significant and they don't know how but after we signed this agreement in november of 2015 that you see there the interesting model we created is a friction free model the entire capex the buildings the equipment for digital empowerment 
the buses they provide to us for converting to digital literacy centers, the multiple large buildings they've given us for creating skills lighthouses, they're offered to us to take over all the municipal schools. And this is entirely funded by the government. So if you look at the government, they fund in a one to 1.5 is to one ratio. So for instance, 2020, 21, this financial year, they have budgeted and will give us 11 crores in CapEx funding. And we will, our own money, as well as raising from other corporates, we will have close to seven crores. And this works together, CapEx from their side, OPEX from our side, to make these happen. Total engagement, which is the power of collaboration, from the mayor to the commissioner, to the cooperators, to the staff, from the elected to the selected people who lead the city. The skills partner from across the city and across the country that we choose to actually work with us in our skills like houses and digital literacy. And the partnership for mobilization, going to the communities with social workers, getting the people, because our goal is in every household in the city, we must make a difference, either through education or digital empowerment or through uh, uh, skills. So if you look at, I mean, I won't even go through this logo shop, but it's literally every significant company partners with us, government, skills partners, employment agencies, which of course is not only the employment agencies, but also the eventual um, uh, recruiters and people who give entrepreneurship opportunities, donors and civil society. So our whole theme is a Sampurna Pune, no child left behind, no slum community left behind and collective action towards making all that happen. What does this mean just in terms of outcomes over the last five years? And obviously it keeps scaling multiple times every year. 10,000 youth are enrolled in seven cities in seven lighthouses, which is what we call our skill centers, in the seven administrative wards. We have seven more to set up, actually. Digitally empowered, our target is that we must have two lakh citizens digitally empowered. We've reached 48,000 and adding at the rate of multiple per day, 19 digital centers and buses. In the Pune Municipal Co Corporation Schools, we've identified some models of excellent schools, and we have 1,200 teachers completely transformed through a Shiksak Sayogi program and 5,000 students in these models of excellent schools, which are making the difference. The most important part, coming back to collaboration, is, is the importance of and joy of the Pune Municipal Corporation and Pune City Connect and all our partners. It's a PPP model par excellence. And we're finding that there is genuine co-ownership, there's mutual respect. And interestingly, this came from one of our youngest employees after a year. She said, we love working with colleagues. I mean, what's their distrust? Because everybody is willing to help us because we are engaged together in a great cause. The good news is that, I mean, we've been recognized many, many times. I mean, just to give you a few examples, the Pune Lighthouses actually received the Smart Cities Award for the best social project across smart cities. You can see Prime Minister Modi there and my friend Kunal Kumar uh, explaining the model to him. Kunal is now the Mission Director of Smart Cities in the Ministry of Urban Development, Government of India, and he's still a great supporter. Multiple new commissioners are continuing to support us. And this was great. We've also awarded the International Wellbeing Award, where our mayor was invited to Montreal to receive it. And most important, Aspen, who needs no introduction, chose us among five anchor partners glo globally for leading sustainable livelihood for low income. There are others in Kenya, in Bogota, Colombia, but we are truly, truly delighted to be part of this program. So what does this mean for us? And I'll close here. What it means is, you can collaborate if we, I mean, I said friction-free model because we don't pay the government anything. The government doesn't need to pay us anything. We raise our money for OPEX, they fund it, it's part of their budget. Every politician knows that nobody's making any money anywhere, but it's all for the good of society. Today, we have operators lining up to say, can you please, please set up a center in my, in my um, uh, constituency? And that's the beauty of what we're seeing. So essentially, when you say Sampurna Pune, what you see those dots there, we are literally my, mapping every slum community, as you can see. And there'll be green dots, pink dots, blue dots to show whether we have touched the household through education or literacy. But eventually our goal is the dots which signify for us livelihoods, happiness, joy, and love should be spread across Pune. So that's why I'm so excited about Pune City. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Natarajan. I think it's... Um your multi-stakeholder approach, uh, the success of working with the government in a, a private-public partnership, I think is one of the fewer successes that India has possibly seen. And I think to be able to create that systems lens and that ecosystem um, for a city, I think is commendable. So thank you so much. Um, I would now like to request Atul, uh, to speak about the collaborative work um, that Eagle Give Foundation has done in the education space.
Thanks, thanks, Shina. Uh, so uh, the program which I am uh, presenting is the Collaborators for Transforming Education. This is a public-private partnership that we have with uh, Government of Maharashtra started uh, back in 2016. So uh, <clears throat> why we thought there is a need to collaborate for an impact at scale was uh, at EDLG we firmly believe that the uh, education is extremely important uh, for uh, accessing a better future. It, is, uh, it will help uh, to solve a lot of problems. And uh, the studies like uh, the ASAR was showing continuous decline in the uh, levels of uh, learning uh, among the children in the state. We also, when we researched through, uh, when we decided to collaborate, I think, what, what, what is it that is lacking? So what we found is uh, there are programs that are running in different, uh, different places, but uh, they lack a, a, a total uh, systems uh, change approach. They are small, they are not uh, looking at the issue in a holistic manner and uh, you know, uh, are not able to uh, give that relevance to the, to the state that uh, gives a confidence to scale up the program. You know, there may be a program which is running fantastic in say uh, 50 schools, 100 schools, but a, a, a state is, uh, I mean, forget the state a district which has close to 2,000 schools the district education officers would really not find it relevant as to how they would uh, be able to take the learnings from these small uh, experiments to uh, to the uh, to the entire district we also thought that uh, the solving this problem is is not possible to uh, you know uh, to be addressed by one single person you know one single organization for simple reason that the kind of resources that that it uh, requires to address uh, uh, the issue, not only resources in terms of money, but is resources also in terms of the uh, expertise, experience of working in the sector. You will find that organizations who are running these small uh, efforts, they usually find their expertise in one area and not really in all aspects, which will uh, bring, the, bring all these stakeholders together to address the problem in a uh, system change approach or in a holistic manner. So uh, we decided to collaborate with uh, this single objective. It was around the same time the government of Maharashtra announced the quality education program, then known as the Pragat Shakshanik Maharashtra, which uh, provide, which was you know highly focused on improving the learning quality of uh, you know the learning levels of children in the state. We came up with a uh, with a model uh, you know uh, where Eagle Give is the anchor funder in the in the collaborators. Uh, and operates a secretariat, like Shaila just said, it operates a secretariat which brings in uh, multiple partners from the funder side as well as on the implementation side. But we made sure that we also have government as an equal partner in this uh, in this collaboration, ma which makes it uh, gives it the required strength and acceptance at the at the all the levels where we intend to work to bring about the uh, system change. So it will give us the anchor funder and uh, our partner running the secretariat entered into an MOU where uh, other uh, partners don't really enter into an MOU with the government saving them a lot of uh, bandwidth because many times we also see that partners wanting to work with government but the kind of uh, uh, efforts that are required for ensuring alignment, coordination, uh, really uh, they are uh, short of uh, you know, uh, that uh, time resource to dedicate it to that. So it will give took on that responsibility and decided to run this model in a in a different manner. What we usually call you know, as a, a, a fund management approach, where we uh, you know bring in funds from uh, multiple partners and deploy it at the right place, right opportunities, and right skills to see how the change can be uh, achieved in form of the return on that uh, that fund uh, is deployed. Uh, what is important also is not only having a good structure, transparent, uh, you know, governance structures and uh, sufficient, uh, uh, you know, uh, mechanisms put in place, but a strong grassroots work is also equally important to bring about this change. So the focus here was right in the beginning, we thought, you know, as a principle to us is that we don't want to focus on anything that will, uh, uh, you know, that we can scale, but essentially work on something which can be scaled. I think there is a stark difference between these two and uh, that is how we, we as a principle decided to work on that, uh, which, which was only, uh, you know, we believe is a factor which will uh, earn us the, uh, the desired system change uh, going ahead.
over last four years, when we started in 2016, so we, the program is divided into different phases. The first phase was really to uh, look at, uh, demonstrate uh, how, what are the transformative processes that uh, are part of the system, uh, not really bringing them any solution externally so that there is a lot of acceptance and, uh, you know, ownership and accountability from the system side. So modded ex experiment started with uh, five uh, blocks and 272 schools. Uh, in 2018, after two years of work, we scaled the program in uh, in the entire uh, four districts. And in 2000, uh, in the, uh, 19, we scaled our program in six districts, covering all the schools in six districts, which amounts to more than 11,800 school and the program benefits more than 13.2 lakh children and uh, 45,000 teachers. Uh, which also includes, uh, you know, which uh, which in, is in addition to 1,000 uh, education beneficiaries, which includes the block education officer, the Shikshan, uh, the Kendra Pramukhs, which are the cluster leaders, and also the staff at the uh, Diet and the B, uh, BRCs. What have been the achievements uh, here uh, in the in the last four years? So we we find that uh, when we conducted third party assessment. Uh, uh, we find that we have been able to achieve significant uh, enhancement in the learning outcomes. We find that say, while uh, the focus is on mathematics and uh, and uh, language uh, initially, the and the government uh, government's objective is to look at at least 10% increment in the learning outcomes uh, from the baseline. We we see that we have been able to. Uh, achieve more than 70% children uh, we have who have earned grade specific uh, competencies as compared to 60% in non intervention areas. I think uh, we are not looking here at basic uh, literacy and numeracy skills, but, uh, but typically the grade specific uh, competencies that are required. Uh, in addition to that, what a systems change program will also be successful is only when the transformative processes become part of the system and get integrated there. That's the ultimate aim of the of the program when we if you want to uh, achieve a transformative and sustainable change. So what we uh, also been able to achieve is that uh, the Shikshan Parishad, which is the government uh, government's platform only, we brought a remarkable transformation and used uh, to make it a peer learning platform. We also uh, work with the uh, system to enhance the role, responsibility, and functioning of the uh, cluster uh, block and district resource uh, groups to strengthen them. Linkages with Panchayati Raj institutions, that is the Gram Panchayats, uh, Panchayat Samiti, and Jila Parishad, uh, to make education as a priority issue for them has been one of the remarkable, uh, you know, achievements that we have started. We have many number of uh, villages where the uh, school, the village uh, has started conducting uh, education gram sabhas where the uh, the issues are then placed to the main gram sabhas and uh, you know are put on the priority uh, list. Uh, reconstitution and strengthening of roles and responsibilities of the uh, school management committee is also one of the uh, aspects of the program where we have been able to engage the community uh, to a, a, a very very good extent to make sure that the uh, the demand side of the quality education is also strengthened because the SMCs play a great role in uh, in uh, improving the quality of education. We see this as a successful model also of collaboration uh, for impact is also because we have been after four years of program, we have also been receiving uh, uh, requests from other district uh, Jila Parishad to start the intervention in their areas. I think the government, uh, you know, understands what is it that that is useful and helpful for them when they want to achieve something at scale the sense of scale and what will work is is you know best understood by uh, by uh, by the uh, government uh, and the uh, this uh, the invitations to start work in these areas stands testimony to to this uh, we have multiple partners in the program uh, uh, who have uh, extended the funding and their uh, education expertise, which includes the uh, the partner shown on the screen. Gyan Prakash, Kavali and Quest is our uh, implementing partner on the ground who would uh, run the intervention for us. I think when we look at the uh, the uh, uh, the collaboration, we believe that a very, very, very strongly strong governance systems, trust, transparency and role clarity are very, very key uh, and important factors to say that 
uh, when when we want multiple people to come together and uh, work towards one singular cause and bring really a sustainable change i think honesty in communication is also one of the important areas that i would uh, focus uh, here is because the uh, honesty in communication and saying that how uh, you know how we feel comfortable with talking to each other and sharing with each other importantly the bad news right is is something very very important when we uh, work in collaboration uh, so this is this is something i think uh, is extremely important uh, the uh, uh, we are very happy uh, to see the kind of engagement that government uh, you know uh, government has in this program not only at the district level but also at the state uh, and uh, right up to the cluster level the system uh, has uh, you know shown the eagerness and ownership of the program and they feel uh, accountable towards providing quality education i think these are uh, you know very very important early successes uh, which give you confidence that what you are doing is you are on the right path and the system is going to own it over the time thank you thank you atul um i think our, your focus on learning outcomes in a collaborative manner is a big win for um education and i think the last two points that you spoke about communication i think is a key pillar uh, of collaboration uh, because uh, right. without without streamlined communication uh, or open communication collaborations can actually never happen um so i will now take um a moment and um uh um, present the newer collaborations that have sort of come up in response to the covid-19 uh crisis and uh the work that they are doing um so to begin with um i will speak about the covid-19 collaborative it is a collaborative uh by a group of intermediaries that have about 14 intermediaries that have about come together uh it was initiated by atma ridspan and the ate um foundation i think some of the objectives that um that are there is the fact that uh the non it's it's a peer learning platform uh it's the ability to see trends uh for the non-profits it's to be able to um give them a heads up on some of the issues that uh, are affecting all the non-profits help them figure out certain solutions uh that can minimize duplication i think um and to be able to really support non-profits implement some of these solutions and how they how this collaborative is really doing it is through four different um uh, uh through four different corners uh, one is they have a platform a website uh, that is peer learning in nature uh, they do uh, conferences and webinars uh, once a month where it's very um it 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 talks about the messages about what should be done about um uh what is the responsiveness of covid-19 they have a mentorship network um that is very active as well as certain resources and tools that the non-profits can can use um uh, on risk exposure uh, financial planning um as well as model pivot um the next um collaborative uh, is a very interesting one it's really more in the healthcare space um is the covid-19 pandemic um well being task force it is headed by arogya foundation um that works in the cancer early detection uh intel health uh that works in telemedicine and video wiki that does content creation so the fact that three of them have actually come together to be able to to sh um get a suite of products that are contactless and um regionalized for the healthcare system uh so the they complement each other in terms of um their efforts they've been able to find uh digital uh, symptom trackers ai symptom assessments uh teleconsultations they have a ai chat box on how to help some of the workers um a live map of 
of cases, um, PPE kits, um, infection control, and and essentially um, essential healthcare delivery model uh, using technology at scale. And they've been able to localize this across 13 different languages and in the last 75 days. And I think it's totally commendable. Um, at the moment, they work with 20 organizations like Goonj, Women on Wings, uh, to make sure that the last mile delivery actually happens. And um, these are some of the implementation and uh, community partners that they're working with currently. Um, and um, Dr. Priyali is there. So if we have any questions, we can ask her. Um, lastly, I would like to move on to the community collaborative. Uh, which is a long-term sustainable view on how to strengthen uh, communities we serve. Um, given the dynamic crisis that we're dealing with and realizing working together is the way forward. Uh, I think strengthening the communities we serve and collectively having a stronger voice is always better than one. And why is it and how the how of this community collaborative is really one, to be able to achieve some level of stability uh, for the communities in this strange reality today, uh, to be able to understand what that is, uh, to have a partnership strategy, even as an organization or organizations that are serving the community is important. So to make sure that you have partnerships as a key tenant of your um, overall organizational strategy and to be able to engage with other nonprofits and share resources and expertise. And that's really what the community collaborative will be, where nonprofits come together to serve the community and not um, are silo driven, but really more complementary uh, to be able to really uh, bring that alive. There is an approach which is really more phased out to understand what the gaps in the community lie, because each community has different, uh, to understand what that is as a core group, uh, put together certain collective thought on what the needs are and what is the kind of resources that you can allocate, as well as then create an action plan which works collectively um, and track and monitor these objectives towards a common goal like most of the speakers have spoken about today but doing it more at a geographical level um, rather than just a broad level. So start small um, and make change happen there because I think everyone is going to start looking more inward. Um, for the moment where it started is, is we uh, doing it in Kulla, which is um, a ward in Mumbai right now. Um, some of the organizations that are really coming together are two implementation partners, we have a network partner. We have a few um, uh, technical experts that are coming in, uh, depending on the needs and asks of the community. So these were some of the more active ones. Of course, there are far more uh, collaborators that have come up in the healthcare space. And um, so it's important to be for relief um, at, and at different levels. Um, so I will pause here now, and I think we will move on to the Q&A session. Um, so um, I'm just looking at the chat, and um, uh, there are some um, questions that have come. Um, for, we will start with um, Atul. Um, how quality of education can be improved through use of digital platforms in government um, for upper primary schools where they, there's use of smartphones, especially among girls during COVID-19 crisis? I think uh, the uh, the uh, use of digital platforms is is something which is uh, which is already being used in in government schools uh, at multiple places. Uh, we see we work in remote areas of Garchiroli, uh, Nandurbar, Parbhani, and uh, Amravati districts, 
uh, in and the newer districts are satar and solapur what we also see is that the uh, even the government schools have the digital uh, uh, setup digital uh, uh, you know learning uh, aids are there in the schools and are being very regularly used when it comes to uh, you know using the smartphones i think there are certain challenges while they are it is being currently used uh, uh, we have to see that uh, uh, you know uh, the access uh, sometimes become in the remote areas uh, can become a challenge uh, because or because of the uh, you know non availability of networks uh, networking certain parts of the uh, interior parts district for example if you go to garchuloli you really don't have some places where you uh, the connectivity is a problem even if you have proper connectivity uh, you know many places you really won't find uh, the smartphones uh, you know if you want to say use uh, even things like whatsapp or some apps to uh, provide access to some content to the to the children i mean that would include both girls and uh, and boys uh, as well Uh, that also becomes a challenge so while attempts are there to use these uh, learning uh, you know uh, online or digital platforms to use uh, i think uh, there are certain challenges uh, uh, that are that are being faced so uh, you know uh, you will also find that if you go to rural areas you will also find that you know the teachers also create small uh, whatsapp groups and use uh you know provide uh, some information knowledge videos and a regular sharing happens with the with the children because the child essentially spends almost two third of his time out of the school with the parents with the community so uh that time is also very very actively used uh, uh, with use of these digital platforms but some places yes there are definitely uh, challenges thank you atul um so i have a question uh for shelja um could you elaborate on certain specific uh, challenges that adolescents are facing due to the covid-19 and the lockdown and how how programs that are part of the collaborative are responding to this challenge yeah sure and i'm happy to answer that thanks sheena um as i move into that i just wanted to share some context so the 10 to 19 collaborative uh we work across different levels right we as a group uh, as a collaborative are accountable not only for population level impact so exactly you know baseline end line what's going to happen to the lives of young people but we also hold ourselves accountable to the amount of funding we may have leverage or the government policy and advocacy so it ranges from all of uh, you know across that gamut um having said that i think in terms of where the adolescents are in this covid situation um again i think this is a narrative that we've heard again and again that um the people who are most affected and impacted uh in this covid crisis has been the vulnerable populations and actually if you look at adolescent girls they are you know four times vulnerable uh being a woman gender young people not having uh, you know electoral rights um as well as uh, in in the the lack of any choice or voice given to them so this has led to so many issues um and you know and before i go into the specifics i just heard somebody say earlier today that i guess india is managing the health part of covid well you know still it's not as bad as other global nations but i just wanted to bring to the fore here that i think actually we are probably not recognizing it or this the the impact is yet to strike us as we as all of these numbers come up um if you look at menstrual hygiene and the lack of availability of uh, feminine hygiene products uh, or what is it that the adolescent is supposed to do there's absolutely uh, no uh, maybe thinking around it and now the government has actually started doing uh, and taking this very seriously secondly if you look at um uh, you know the issue of safety violence uh, because uh, we know from uh, from the ministry of women and child development department itself where uh, i think a majority of uh, perpetrators were within known areas to to uh, a young boy or a young girl uh, again if these boys and girls are locked in uh, into households without mobility what is going to happen so if we look at just overall these were examples but i think at all levels one education everyone does not have digital access 
or technology will not be able to reach the most vulnerable, what are we going to do? What are some of the suggestions? What are the best practices? Secondly, if you look at uh, safety and the issue of human rights and protection, that is under a huge threat right now. Uh, what are we going to do? Right now, we're understanding that the issue exists, but where is our entire response mechanism? Thirdly, if you look at issues of gender, uh, you know, you look at women actually holding the homes together. We talk about the economy coming to a standstill, but only if globally we had recognized that a half part of our economy works at home, which we don't, econ we don't have any financial value for, we don't understand any worth, and therefore we are able to say there is absolutely no economic progress being made, but women are holding the households together and ensuring that the families work. Thirdly, I think the role of parents. Uh, parents are now going to be looked at as educators, providers. Uh, they have to fulfill economic uh, gains for their family and their communities. Migrants who have come back and from, from other areas have to establish themselves, earn for themselves, look after their children as well. And so what is the role of the parent that we look at as a protector, as a provider, as an educator for that adolescent is to be investigated further. These are just a few of uh, the issues, Sheena, that uh, adolescents and young people are going through. And I'm really, my heart kind of bleeds. And, you know, there was a uh, news article where an 11-year-old girl was walking alone by herself and she died, I think, 18 kilometers right before she reached her home. I think there is nothing more that can illustrate the question of why is this even happening? And forget, you know, there's a migrants issue, all of that. But at an individual level, why is this even happening to this young girl or to anybody for that matter? I, I, I'll pause there. Thanks, Shelja. I think it is, it is emotional for all of us. But I think that's the youth that we're talking about today. And, and what happens to them really determines where this country is really going to go. So we have a, another question. Um, I think any of the panelists can really take this. Uh, how do we foster collaboration between state and its citizens? Considering state is failing to serve migrant laborers, the panel's expert, you will help. Uh, Dr. Natarajan, would you like to take that since you- Sure, I'll just a brief point on this because we've been doing a lot of work with the central government as well as with state and the city government. I think, see, it's a two-way thing, you know, because as I said earlier, even in my presentation, we all start with a level of discomfort, with a level of distrust in the government. And the government also, I mean, has tended to believe in the past that the private sector, particularly, even doesn't care. Civil society, we all know the problems going on with uh, foundations, etc. So I think it's extremely important to foster the, that spirit of collaboration. We also know, and this is something we all should recognize, that, I mean, the migrant labor problem should and could be resolved by central government and state governments, etc. But having said that, we can't wash our hands off and leave it like I mean, like right now, we have 3,000 uh, families being fed in Pune, which is not really the goal of Pune City Connect, but it's something that we know we have to do. Because if we have to talk about Sampurna Pune, we have to make, make... So I think each one of us can do our bit, whether we are in small towns, large cities, etc. Rather than sit back and you know do Twitter and Facebook posts criticizing everybody, yeah. it's important to collaborate. Because naturally, the government should do its bit. I'm not absolving the government of responsibility. But surely, we can do our bit. And every little bit will alleviate, even if it alleviates the problems of 0.001% and maybe saves 400 lives, like the one that Sherja was talking about. I mean, each one of us should take responsibility for a death in the country. Thank you, uh, Dr. Natarajan. Um, I would like to extend um, a question to... Um, um, Mary Allen um, from Atma. Um, how has the collaborative, the COVID-19 collaborative um, helped the sector deal with the crisis and some of the organizations uh, in terms of um, uh, pivoting in terms of the models that they've been using? Uh, so if you could share some light on that. Uh, thanks, Sheena. Um... That was a, um, Mr. Natarajan, a real um, evocative point you just made. So it just res I was just letting that resonate with me um, as Sheena was asking the question. Um, so I think for, for 
us uh, as a collaborative, what we came together to do was really to help organizations and highlight what is going to be the effects of, um, of the crisis on the social sector and on um, nonprofits themselves and how do they need to think about responding. So initially, I think there was an attitude of um, once the lockdown was announced that we'll wait this out. And the first few uh, few weeks, everyone said, well, we'll, in two weeks, we'll just go back to normal. Um, and that really started to scare us <laughs> um, because it was becoming very clear that normal was not going to be re-emerging anytime soon. And so um, through the collaborative, what we've done is we've encouraged people, one, to start thinking for the long term, start planning um, both financially um, for multiple scenarios that are going to emerge and start thinking, now we're in the space of thinking about what is the relevance of your program um, for the various futures that are going to emerge in front of us. Um, so for example, Atma's work is mainly focused in education. There are uh, going to be in Maharashtra in particular, um, where we're situated, extended uh, uh, closures of schools. Um, a lot of children are going to miss out on their education. That being uh, a key component of a lot of education service delivery, how are organizations going to be retooling themselves to actually um, address the needs of their students going forward? And so these are, for each organization, these are individual questions that they need to ask. Um, but we're, what we're working to do is provide a framework, um, resources and tools for organizations to actually think through those important questions um, and be able to come up with new designs and new answers uh, for for uh, the communities that they serve. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Priyanjali. Um, what uh, what motivated you, and what was the commonality between your organizations? Because they're so stark um, um, to come together. Um, since you're for this COVID-19 task force and it's in the healthcare space. So could you share some insights on that, please? Sure, thanks Sheena and thanks Priya for having uh, us here today with such an esteemed panel. Uh, to answer your question, Sheena, the commonality was really that we were lucky to be all the incubators of Encore. So we kind of knew each other's strengths <laughs> and uh, we just hustled in a few days and figured out and that thank you for self promotion i have to tell you sheena <laughs> not pay her to say that <laughs> uh, so uh, we 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 always knew that you know intellihealth has been doing telemedicine for such a long time and not just india but countries like syria and all that and we have been doing cancer detection for women uh, in india video wiki has been doing so much content creation and the most important thing is to deliver this content to in local languages for anyone to understand was really raw strengths that we brought in. And uh, we quickly could not duplicate each other's work and form a common platform and suit of products, which would not just help during COVID's uh, response, but also in the post pandemic era to have a infrastructure ready to deliver and ensure that uh, delivery of essential healthcare services are there. Because uh, during our first analysis of uh, the entire report we have made, we received uh, teleconsultation for more essential healthcare services rather than COVID, like elderly care uh, for diabetes, hypertension management, mental health. And people were not able to access a lot of uh, general practitioners. And uh, a lot of healthcare professionals are struggling there's a lot of mistrust for healthcare professionals in the society right now because people are scared to go and walk into a healthcare facility and touch anything. So even a BP machine is uh, looking like an infected COVID source. So <laughs> we, we thought that as much as we can deliver uh, in a contactless manner uh, with the help of home treatment, that would help unburden the healthcare infrastructure, keep the healthcare uh, professionals and workers at grassroots level a little safer and also deliver essential healthcare services to the end beneficiary. 
we were very lucky to find help and co collaborate with very large organizations like Goonj, Women on Wings, uh, Fulora Foundation, and uh, give training to organizations like Pratham for infection control, etc. And uh, I think they are the ones who already are reaching to masses with other essential services like food, uh, safety, um, everything. So that really helped us disseminate our solutions across uh, the actual people, the migrant workers that we are talking about to have healthcare services as well. So that is uh, what has been happening. No, it's really great because COVID is not going away anywhere. And we need more and more. Uh, so the fact that it is contactless and it's a platform, um, I think the, the impact of using technology as an enabler to scale is, um, is great. So um, on that note, um, I would just like to um, sign off and say, um, today we're faced with um, unprecedented crisis with a range of challenges. However, every crisis that does present an opportunity. And I hope that this will bring many more of us together to work towards collective action in, in innovative ways through innovative models. And with this, I would like to thank all um, up my panelists here, as well as thank you everyone. Um, I know it's been a very long day um, for a very absorbing session and sharing your learnings and experiences. Uh, thank you and have a nice weekend. Are we on time, Priya? Yes, we are. Yeah, thank you so thank much you. to the panelists and to Sheena. Uh, this uh, whole track was uh, a small one paragraph blurb uh, about 10 days back. And to take that small blurb and to build out something as of a storyline um, is just amazing. Uh, all the speakers came in uh, spent a lot of time thinking about what can be very helpful for the sector at this point in time. There was a very interesting comment that somebody has uh, had mentioned, and I want to share that uh, with the group uh, because it wasn't something that we could, we, that all the attendees saw. But it said that after a long time, I am feeling extremely optimistic, which is a very rare feeling lately. So thank you for creating optimism into the sector right now. And thank you, Nudge Foundation. Um, even though it was a 10 day old idea, but you all pulled it off. So kudos to you and the team and have a glass of wine from all of us. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.